following voices are AI generated. We hope you enjoy the video. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We decided to join Sonic, Amy, Shadow, Knuckles, Blaze, and Silver to review the Iron Claw and having a chat about pro wrestling. Indeed. It was Amy's idea to have more of us here. It's crowded, but we all love wrestling and A24 movies. This is so cool. Sonic and the others are like having another party, but this time, we're invited. Unlike their WrestleMania 40 review, they better give us that Baja blast. What's up, Team Chaotix? I have to admit that a review of the Iron Claw and a wrestling chat with you guys sounds fun, and here you go. The best tropical citrus soda in the world. Despite us hedgehogs being the main stars of the channel, we do need more hosts if we're going to bring up pro wrestling again, since every one of us loves it. And the fact that some fans might be bored of me and the blue and pink hedgehogs. Let's say that this is a test for the Chaotix to do their video with us guiding them. And next time we all have a pro wrestling video, it'll take place around late August to early September to review SummerSlam. It makes sense. SummerSlam is part of the Big Four WWE pay-per-view, or as they prefer to call them, premium live events these days. Hold on, everybody. If anyone's gonna talk on pro wrestling, I better join in. Wow, two knuckles? That's ten of us in total. I thought the chat with Sonic, Amy, Shadow, the Ogre Shrek, SpongeBob, and that human boy genius Jimmy Neutron about the 2000s was huge. Not exactly, Silver. This video is a hold my beer to that 2000s video. We're not going to talk about Mariah Carey or our games this time. And thank God I'm not the only girl in this video. Also, welcome Blaze from our era, the 4Kids era to our channel. This is her first appearance. I'm the only character from the current slash meta era in this video because 4Kids Amy suggested the review of The Iron Claw in a video back in January about the terminated second channel 1AICL having its first strike. Too bad none of the chaotics from a single era ever did song covers on that channel. Hell, we never showed up at the funeral either because we had a cold. Yeah! We didn't want to make anyone sick at the funeral. And it was raining, so it could have made us even more sick if we showed up. But at least you guys were there in spirit, and hey, pro wrestling will bring us all together. Say, The Iron Claw is a biographical movie following the events of the Von Erich family. And it's sadly known for the curse, as each sibling faces a tragedy except for Kevin Von Erich. Zac Efron plays Kevin Von Erich, and he was shredded for the role. Although he was in great shape, he was not as tall as the real-life Kevin Von Erich. As a matter of fact, none of the actors were as tall as the real-life Von Erichs. Silver, you might want to lower your voice. We might have tinnitus from your shouts, but anyway. The film is also known for certain inaccuracies and miscasting of actors not looking like the wrestlers they portrayed like Ric Flair. He was in shape, but didn't look nor sound like the nature boy in the face. Enough exposition. Let's watch the film and give the fans our thoughts. Two hours and 12 minutes later. Wow, the movie sure ended on a bittersweet note. To summarize the plot, it starts with the father of the family, Fritz being in his heyday, and the movie was in black and white. We even see him with his wife, and they have the boys who grow up as the Von Erich brothers. The movie then changes from black and white to color. We see the brothers live their lives being in their promotion WCCW in Texas, which is where they live, and they're a popular act. Kevin meets this hot girl named Pam, and they date. The first half of the movie was mellow yet fun, but it immediately got tragic right away in the second half when David got sick after Kevin and Pam's wedding party. David passed away in his hotel in Japan while on a tour. The cause of death was acute enteritis, an inflammation of the intestines. He was supposed to win the world championship if he were popular in Japan, but because of his passing, we never see him win the gold. Despite David being the first brother to be shown as a victim of the curse, it was actually Jack Jr. who passed away first when they were young. Kevin mentioned his late brother to Pam during their first date. It's even sadder that Jack Jr. was six at the time. The other brothers, Carrie and Mike, also pass away at different times. Mike was taking drugs and alcohol after suffering from toxic shock syndrome and took his own life in 1987. 
Carey got his foot amputated after a motorcycle accident, and because of the constant pain, he took his own life by taking a shotgun to his heart at the ranch. It was tragedy after tragedy. The only Von Erich brother left that took his own life was Chris, the youngest of the brothers. But he wasn't in the movie due to the production team saying that the film would have been too bleak for it to withstand. At least the wrestling itself was a true highlight, right? Four kids, Sonic? Yeah, I heard that Chavo Guerrero, the nephew of the late great Eddie Guerrero, was the wrestling consultant. I think that's why the wrestling was just awesome. Sure, the sadness and the tragedies outweighed the wrestling, but man, that movie was awesome. Did you see the drop kicks? Boom, lights out. Awesome. You call that awesome blue hedgehog. It was a tragedy, a cautionary tale of ambition gone wrong, and frankly, melodramatic. It is an A24 movie after all. But they were just kids, living their dreams even when things got tough. Can someone hand me a tissue? I'm crying. I got tissues. I had a feeling this movie would make at least one person cry. Despite the inaccurate moments, it was still a stellar yet sad film. It makes me want to see more biopics of wrestlers for all the non-wrestling fans to see. Give me those tissues. I feel so bad for the Von Erichs. Poor Kevin doesn't have any brothers left. Chin up, knucklehead. He has two sons, and they go by their real last name, Adkison, and they're alive and well. Yeah, see? Talk about inspiring. Those Von Erich brothers, they never gave up. They were like super-powered wrestlers, even against real-life bad guys. Real-life bad guys? Do you mean their own family and their inner demons? That domineering father pushing them to the breaking point? I'm sorry, but I'm stating the truth. Shadow! Be nice! They had a bond, a family love that kept them going, even through the darkness. Yeah, Fritz was strict, but he loved his sons. I've seen tons of sports drama movies over the years, and this one is by far one of the best that I've seen. It's right up there with Rocky, The Wrestler, and Rudy as one of the greatest sports movies, in my opinion. That's a bold take, and I respect that. It was a heartbreaker and a movie that needs to be seen to be believed. And it took us half a year to finally review it. I thought we were gonna watch that Hulk Hogan movie, No Holds Barred, or that David Arquette movie, Ready to Rumble, before I joined this video. Both of the movies Knuckles mentioned were completely goofy and terrible, but at the same time, they have one thing in common with the Iron Claw, they all got the stars. And. Pro wrestling is something that I think is the closest thing along with track races. And American football can have humans be like us, the Mobians. Exactly. Like us, right? We fight, we argue, we race, we slam into each other, but in the end, we're always there for each other, no matter what. I suppose even the ultimate life form can appreciate a touch of sentimentality now and then. See? Even Shadow gets it. Can we chat about wrestling now? We gotta lighten things up. As long as it involves actual athleticism and not just a ton of emotional melodrama, I'm game. I'm the last person that gets into drama. Just ask Shadow when the Chaotix convinced him not to end his life in his only game. I remember like it was yesterday. In Shadow's game, I didn't know what discs were. I was such a dunce. Okay, okay. Enough sappy stuff. And the current slash Meta Knuckles is right. Let's talk more about wrestling. We can bring up Vince McMahon and tons of fun trivia. And maybe we can eat some extra chili dogs at the end of the video. Let's also change the background. There we go. We should probably start when wrestling was changing during the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold your horses, Knuckles. You're talking about before none of us were even a twinkle in Dr. Eggman's eye. Back in the 60s through 80s, wrestling wasn't just WWE on repeat. It was like a whole different planet. Yeah, back then the WWE was the WWF, and it was a smaller territorial promotion until the 80s boom when Hulk Hogan and the other stars made the promotion big and mainstream. It's a good thing most of us know our wrestling facts except for Charmy. Fascinating. Enlighten us, everyone, with each of your ancient wisdom. Let me go first. Here goes. Imagine America, but instead of states, you have wrestling territories. Each one with its own champ, its own stars, and its own matches. 
It was like a giant rumble on a national scale. Wow! Like different teams? Each with their own special styles and moves? Exactly! You had the NWA down in the South, all boots and brawling! The AWA in the Midwest, with technical wizards like Vern Gagne, and up in the Northeast, the WWF, slowly building its empire with Bruno Sammartino, Pedro Morales, and Bob Backlund. It was like smaller leagues, all vying for the top spot. Not really, Espio. It was more like a big family feud. Each territory had its own traditions, its own legends. Guys like Terry Funk, Dusty Rhodes, Ric Flair, they were kings in their own castles, you know? But then something happened. It was something big that made everything change. What Blaze was referring to is Hulk Hogan. That's when the Immortal One comes in. He was like a radioactive chili dog, bursting with charisma and body slams. The WWE, then known as WWF, saw his potential, and boom! They turned him into a national phenomenon, rock and wrestling connection style. Anyone can argue it was a big change in the sport. A big, powerful company getting bigger to show other promotions who's boss of the wrestling chaos. Maybe, maybe not. Some say the territorial days were more personal, more raw. You could see your heroes live right in your hometown back then. I think it's like having different kinds of flowers. Each one is beautiful in its own way. I like that comparison, Amy. And hey, even with Hogan's rise, the territorial spirit never truly died. It lives on in the independent scene, in the passion of the fans. A curious analogy, but perhaps not entirely inaccurate. That's what I was gonna say. So what do you say, team? Let's celebrate all eras of wrestling. From territorial throwdowns to Hulkamania to today's age of wrestling for the love of the sport. We can't talk about the WWF takeover without mentioning the elephant in the ring who brags about his grapefruits, Vince McMahon. Yes, the architect of the wrestling empire, a man of both vision and disgustingly questionable morals. My parents used to tell me stories about Vince Sr., how he promised his partners he'd never crush the smaller promotions. But then the devil, Vince Jr., came along. Vince Jr. saw the potential for a nationwide monopoly, a giant wrestling buffet. He bought up territories, snatched their stars, and boom! The WWF became the only game in town. You could say it was a ruthless strategy, but it was very effective. That grapefruit guy built a global phenomenon, a spectacle that captivated millions. But at what cost? He broke promises, marginalized smaller promotions, and, well, there are those allegations about his conduct. That's the dark side of the ring, Amy, and not the Vice series. Let's say the grapefruit guy, Vince McMahon, had his fair share of controversies. Indeed. But one cannot deny his impact on the industry. The perverted devil revolutionized entertainment wrestling, blurred the lines between reality and showmanship and created a platform for some of the greatest wrestlers ever! But we can't forget the price some paid for his ambition. It's a story with two sides, Vector. A tale of triumph and tragedy, of dreams built and dreams crushed. A complex legacy, one that deserves to be examined with both admiration and scrutiny. Hey! Both knuckleheads are covering my ears! I wanna hear! Sorry, kid! The next part is a little too gross for you to hear! And I can tell your Shadow is clenching his fists because of the mention of the grapefruit guy! Shadow, do you have anything to say about Vince McMahon? McMahon's business acumen. Undeniable. He built an empire and carved a niche in the entertainment world. But his personal conduct? A tapestry woven with darkness. That's heavy words, Shadow! Don't hold back! Spill the tea! The mistreatment of women behind the scenes, the culture of silence fostered through NDAs, and recently, too, it paints a grim picture. A picture that, frankly, turns my stomach. That's why I call him the perverted devil. I hear you, Shadow. I've heard the phrase, power can corrupt, and in the wrong hands, it can become a weapon! But, hey! Not everything's black and white, right? Vince did change the game, bringing wrestling to a whole new level. Remember that WrestleMania 3 main event? Hogan vs. Andre the Giant? Epic! The body slam is the best part of the match! I concede that was a spectacle, but one cannot condone personal transgressions for the sake of entertainment. And in the 80s, 
a female referee named Rita Chatterton filed a lawsuit against McMahon for sexual misconduct, and because of it, we wouldn't see female referees in WWE until the 2010s. Although, we can appreciate the good while still speaking out against the bad. It's about holding powerful figures accountable and using our voices to fight for what's right. Can I hear now? Thanks, Knuckleses! How about we talk about something recent? Sure, I got something recent. The future ain't all doom and gloom, right? Think about it. WWE merged with UFC last year. They're two giants of the fight game joining forces. It was a bold move, and one that could reshape the entire combat entertainment landscape. And Triple H is at the helm! He's been making moves for years, putting the spotlight on women's wrestling and building NXT into a powerhouse. Yes, and he's got a different style than Vince Sr. or Jr., more focused on the talent, the stories, the spectacle. Maybe, just maybe, this new era will be different. Optimism is key, guys, but not one I entirely use on a regular basis. Perhaps this merger, this new leadership, could pave the way for a brighter future for both wrestling and MMA. That's the spirit, SBO. We can't forget the lessons of the past, but we can also hope for a better tomorrow. Let's think of the legacy of wrestling. From territorial throwdowns to UFC knockouts and keep fighting for what we believe in. What a coincidence that both WWE and their biggest competition, AEW, have CEOs both last named Khan. And they're not related. I bet in an alternate universe, Nick Khan and Tony Khan are related, and they both wanted to have a family feud by having two huge wrestling promotions. But alas, that's not true. I wish it could be, but no. There is one good thing from the past we can think about. You got that right, current Knuckles. Let's not forget the other side of the coin. Back in the 90s, WCW was rising like a comet, challenging the WWF throne. Hulk Hogan jumped ship. Nitro went live. It was a wrestling war. Indeed. The Monday Night Wars. A brutal battle for ratings and supremacy. WCW, with its edgy attitude, the NWO rebellion, cruiserweight showcases, they pushed the boundaries. But the WWF didn't back down. Stone Cold Steve Austin, the Attitude Era, mankind falling off hell in a cell. Pure madness. Pure entertainment. Remember that night Nitro had Rick Rude the same day he was on Raw when it was pre-taped? Talk about a power move. But WWF retaliated with Raw is War, live too. Every Monday was a fight, a spectacle. They had The Rock, Triple H, The Hardy Boys, and Edge and Christian. A clash of titans, a test of creativity, a crucible that forged some of the greatest moments in wrestling history. And it wasn't just about the stars. The fans were part of it. The chants, the big signs, the electric atmosphere. It was like the whole world was watching. In the end, WCW couldn't keep the pace, whether it was Vince Russo or Hulk Hogan. But their legacy lives on. Nitro's innovation, the NWO's impact, those cruiserweight classics, they changed the game forever. As Steve Austin would say, hell yeah. It was a tale that'll never be redone. It was a reminder that even empires can crumble but also a testament to the power of wrestling to captivate and inspire. Silver's right. From territorial days to the Monday Night Wars, wrestling is a story of passion, drama, and triumph. And it's still evolving, still pushing boundaries. Do you know what's crazy? The Monday Night Wars were heating up around the same time the Sonic franchise going through a bit of a rough patch after Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Remember those bad Sonic handheld games with weird gimmicks like Labyrinth and Blast? Labyrinth and Blast on the Game Gear come to mind as failures. Even the Saturn game Xtreme was cancelled, and of course, Sonic R wasn't so good, but it had a kick-ass soundtrack. It was a period of artistic exploration. Shall we say... It happens to the best of us! Our franchise bounced back with Adventure 1, a revolution in 3D! Just like the WWF did with the Rock and Stone Cold and the Attitude Era. Then the Dreamcast slash Adventure Era crew took over before we did in 2005. We each learned from our mistakes, embraced change, and came out stronger. We found our own versions of Austin 316 and Mankind falling off the hell in a cell! Despite none of us being in the games until the mid-2000s, we felt how our previous counterparts felt. A curious metaphor, Vector, 
but one that holds some merit. The WWF capitalized on its star power, its raw energy, its willingness to push boundaries, and my good friends, we all embrace the freedom of 3D, the thrill of new gameplay mechanics. And look where it got us both! The Sonic Adventure Games masterpieces! The WWF dominating the ratings. Proof that sometimes a little adversity can lead to greatness. You said it, four kids, Charmy. The Monday Night Wars and the Sonic franchise each had comeback stories for the ages. And it's a sign that you should never give up on your dreams, no matter how many times you take chair shots to the head or getting slammed into tables. I can feel the pain of getting my head slammed by those steel chairs. And I can feel the flaming tables that ECW would regularly use back then. That was my favorite part, flaming tables. Remember back in our glitter video game idea video? Shadow and Amy mentioned the biggest botch in wrestling history, the invasion. WWF buys WCW. It was supposed to be epic, right? Superstars clashing, worlds colliding, chili dog mayhem, but no. The reality was decidedly less dramatic. It was like watching Knuckles try to punch himself while hanging upside down on the monkey bars in a playground. WCW had Sting, Goldberg, Scott Steiner, and all they had in WWF was Buff Bagwell and a bunch of lower mid-carters. Where were the legends, the icons? Oh! I remember this one. Early on before the invasion storyline, the grapefruit guy Vince was too busy playing football with his XFL to care, and it of course flopped big time. The big WCW names were stuck at home, collecting checks from Time Warner, while the WCW B team ran wild on Raw. Talk about a total letdown. What's even sadder is that they only had Booker T and Diamond Dallas Page and WWF screwed them over and buried them. It was a strategic blunder of epic proportions, a prime opportunity squandered on self-indulgent ventures. But it wasn't all bad! Rob Van Dam versus Jeff Hardy in the Invasion pay-per-view? That was a fight for the ages! And seeing Kurt Angle and Steve Austin beating each other up was pure gold! Yeah, there were some bright spots. Like The Rock winning the WCW Championship and Kurt Angle winning the WWF Championship at Unforgiven. But overall, the invasion was a dud. A giant pile of hype with the payoff of a deflated beach ball. The Alliance was full of cheaters and sore losers who constantly fought dirty. And the WWF was clearly the winners. Even the double agent Kurt Angle was a wasted opportunity. They should have just waited another year to have the invasion angle work since the real WCW stars showed up a year later. It sure was a crappy story that should have been monumental. A reminder that even the mightiest empires can make colossal mistakes when blinded by hubris and misplaced priorities. Vince just had to rub in his ego that he won the war. Maybe someday there'll be another epic clash of wrestling worlds. Done right this time. We can throw parties and have snacks for everyone. But seriously, what were they thinking with DDP and Booker T? They were WCW Gold, and the WWF turned them into a stalker and a spin rooney specialist, respectively. What a waste! Their booking was an affront to both logic and athleticism, a strategic miscalculation of the highest order. And don't even get me started on Steve Austin! The Rock vs. Steve Austin rivalry was WWF magic, and they tossed it aside because... reasons? Vince wanted Austin on the WCW side to keep the whole thing alive! So we had Stone Cold become a heel again, one of the worst heel turns in history, all because the real stars were sitting at home chilling and counting cash from Time Warner. A desperate maneuver, one that ultimately exposed the flaws in the Invasion's foundation. Without iconic clashes and genuine stakes, the whole concept crumbled like a very stale bagel in our detective agency. Not to mention the WWF guys jumping ship to the Alliance were pushed better than the original mid-card WCW wrestlers. It's like they forgot what wrestling is all about. The stories, the rivalries, the passion. The invasion had none of that. Just empty hype and forgettable gimmicks. They should have taken a page out of my book. When I face Eggman, I don't mess around with backup dancers or fake alliances. I punch, I jump, I climb my way to victory. However, I do believe the lessons of the invasion are more nuanced 
than simply requiring a simple brawl. Still, we can't forget the wasted potential. Imagine a proper clash of champions. Sting versus Undertaker. Goldberg versus Steve Austin. The Rock versus DDP. Chills, guys, chills. You said it, Meta Knuckles. The invasion could have been legendary, but they dropped the ball harder than our four kids' knuckles falling off the death egg. Let's just hope they learned their lesson for the sake of future wrestling dreams. And speaking of dreams, in our 2000s chat with Jimmy Neutron Shrek and SpongeBob, we mentioned the name and logo change from WWF to WWE in 2002. Ah uh, yes, the name change. A branding refresh, a reinvention, or a clever way to avoid legal battles with grumpy pandas. Maybe a bit of it all, Shadow. But you gotta admit, WWE sounds bigger, bolder, more global than WWF, like the wrestling universe itself! And 2002 was WWE's significant year! The Rock versus Lesnar for the title, Hulk Hogan's comeback, Kurt Angle getting his head shaved, classic moments left and right! While WWE basked in the spotlight, some new challengers emerged. A tiny NWA with its X Division high flyers. And that is TNA, dude! Jeff Jarrett and Raven's flock squawking like Jet the Hawk annoying Sonic and the gang! They were like the cool kids in the schoolyard doing their own thing! And Ring of Honor! Brian Danielson, Samoa Joe, Christopher Daniels, Technical Masters, Indie Darlings, pushing the boundaries of in ring storytelling! These guys started in ROH before they went to the big leagues. But let's be real, none of them could touch the WWE powerhouse yet. Raw was still king, SmackDown was on the rise, and The Rock was figuratively cooking pie every Monday and Thursday night. Sure, the early 2000s indie wrestlers are currently well known today, but back then, they weren't as mainstream. True. However, the rise of these alternatives offered a smorgasbord of wrestling styles a diversity of storylines, and a breeding ground for future stars. Bingo! 2002 wasn't just about WWE and its ruthless aggression era. It was the year wrestling branched out, diversified, and kept the adrenaline pumping for all kinds of fans. Another wrestling-related topic we brought up in our 2000s video was AEW, fully known as All Elite Wrestling. Despite the video focusing on 2000 to 2009, AEW was founded in 2019, which is five years ago, as of this video's recording. And we also brought up Chris Jericho, our favorite wrestler. The wrestler rock star would get us hooked for new action. Despite the fans wanting him to retire, he's so good at reinventing himself. Jericho is a tough man who's multi-talented, and his band Fozzy Rocks. And whenever the hedgehogs bring up Chris Jericho... They always mention the diva singer Mariah Carey, too! But not this time! The diva singer won't be a topic in this video! I'm more into other singers like Jennifer Hudson or Alicia Keys. Maybe in a future video, I can discuss my taste in music, like in the old video with Dreamcast Rouge, and both our Amy and Dreamcast Amy from last year. Great! Can we at least compare which wrestling company is better? AEW or WWE. I love WWE, especially today with its improving product. That's one way to wrap up the video. I love both companies and they have all the stars we can remember and they're newcomers. How about you go next, Amy? Okay, let's get one thing straight. I love AEW because it's the future of wrestling. Fresh talent, unpredictable storylines, high-flying action. It's all about the fans. The passion, the excitement. A bold claim, Amy. While AEW's potential is undeniable, one cannot simply dismiss the powerhouse that is WWE. Years of experience, global reach, iconic moments. They've built an empire, Amy. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Easy there, hedgehogs! There's room for both of them! WWE's got the classics, the nostalgia, the larger-than-life characters. AEW's got the innovation, the agility, the underdog spirit. Both bring something different to the table, right? Sorry, Vector, but I'm siding with Amy. How can you compare them? WWE recycles the same storylines, pushes the same superstars, feels like it's stuck in the past. AEW is all about pushing boundaries, taking risks, letting the wrestlers be themselves. Well... 
I'm with Shadow. While your enthusiasm is commendable, charming, one must acknowledge the undeniable production value of WWE. The stage, the pyro, the entrances, they create a spectacle, a larger-than-life experience. AEW, while charmingly raw, still has room to grow in that department. I agree with Sonic and Vector on liking both WWE and AEW. Can't we just appreciate both for what they are? We have SmackDown on Friday, Dynamite on Wednesday, and both Rampage and Collision. Wait, when is Rampage again? It's every Friday after SmackDown, you knucklehead. God, you're so hopeless. But I'll have to admit that WWE has some good things along with AEW. Like Rey Mysterio, he's still amazing. I gotta go with AEW and WWE. And I can admit that AEW's tag team division is truly phenomenal. Those young bucks are a force to be reckoned with. WWE has awesome long-term storytelling. WWE is what I love first, but I can't say no to AEW either. They're both epic. See? We can agree. Now, how about we settle this like civilized people after this video? An eating contest! Winner gets bragging rights for a week! And Blaze thought my shouts could cause tinnitus. Current knuckle shouts would make us full-on deaf. I agree. And an eating contest? I'm in it to win it. This is a great challenge. You're on, current knuckles. Prepare to be devoured. <laughs> Let us see if anyone can match my appetite. That's all for today, ladies and gentlemen. It was our first wrestling chat with Sonic and the gang, and our next wrestling video will just have us chaotic. We'll have to review a WWE event for next time, particularly a more recent event. We could do a roundup of the ones made this year, and maybe even talk about tropes, long-term storylines, gimmicks, controversial shows, and wrestling legends. Be sure to like, comment, favorite, and share. Remember to click on the bell so you won't miss new videos. And spread the word. Follow us on TikTok. Subscribe to Juan CL on YouTube and stick around and stay tuned for more videos. Now, who wants to say it? I guess I'll say it because it's my first appearance. We'll see you guys later. Peace out and rock on. <laughs>